Laurel, when, when you were talking about letters of rec, I just imagined like a letter of <laughs> like Rex. Okay. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> welcome everyone to the Northwest um, uh, Database Society uh, series of talks. Uh, today it's my great pleasure to introduce Arun Kumar. Um, Arun is a professor at the University of um, California, San Diego. Uh, he is a world uh, leader in, uh, um, in, in the, at the intersection of machine learning and databases. Uh, he um, received the uh, Sigma Best Paper Award on this topic. Um, and um, here, uh, what else can I tell you here? I also graduated from, from Wisconsin uh, and uh, had many um, collaborations with um, uh, um, um, on projects that ended up in industry, including, for example, Madlib, which is uh, the well-known uh, system that combines databases with machine learning. So today he's going to talk about his data series in this area. Okay. Thank you, Dan. So I hope the mic is working and everything is set up. And I can tell for sure that this room, every, I'm going to be audible to everyone. So I don't have to ask that question. Let's get started. Uh, and thanks for the extensive introduction, Dan. And world well, leader is a little bit of too much, but thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming to my talk. Um, let's get started. We all know we are living in the golden age of machine learning based analytics. I don't have to belabor this point because you are right here in Seattle where Amazon and Microsoft are extensively using machine learning for all, all sorts of things from recommendations to web security to web search. And of course, Google and Facebook are also doing this. Now, the tremendous success of machine learning based analytics applications in some of these companies has inspired uh, a huge demand for tools that make it easier to integrate machine learning into data analytics applications in a variety of domains in the traditional enterprise sectors, like healthcare, insurance, retail, finance, telecom, as well as in the academic domains like the sciences and even digital humanities. The International Data Corporation estimates that the market size for products that allow you to use machine learning in your uh, environments much more easily is likely to go up to $60 billion per year over the next several years. And this is a year and a half old estimate. Naturally, there's a huge amount of action in this space in terms of open source tools and uh, products for making it easier to build machine learning models. A um, lot of the cloud vendors are building APIs for machine learning training and inference in the cloud, saying everything is going to be now in the cloud. But in spite of all this progress, as I will explain today, there still remain numerous fundamental bottlenecks in the end-to-end -end process of building and deploying machine learning-based analytics applications. And at the end of the day, my research is about abstractions, algorithms, and systems that help mitigate these bottlenecks and accelerate the ML application lifecycle from a data management and system standpoint. And by acceleration, I mean both system efficiency, the runtime, and the requirements for the uh, techniques and the systems involved, and human efficiency the productivity of the uh, users involved in the loop. And my research synthesizes and innovates upon the fields of data management and databases, systems, and machine learning and AI. So what is this ML application lifecycle that I'm talking about? In the real world, it revolves primarily around this role called a data scientist or an ML engineer. And they are in charge of using data systems and ML systems to steer three main processes. The first is sourcing where they go from raw data to data that can be used to train ML models. This involves procuring, schematizing, cleaning, and preparing training data from multi-relational databases, from text documents, from multimedia data, time series, and so on. Then comes the process of building the ML model. Now, building the ML model, you have to go through this process of model selection. Even if you have your training data well-defined, you have to figure out what prediction functions you're going to use. That involves various things like feature selection, hyperparameter tuning, and algorithm selection. And then comes the process of deployment, where you integrate the prediction functions that you've trained with your application. And this could be in the form of integrating it with data processing systems, like DBMSs, for presentation purposes, and also for powering cloud services that can be accessed from various devices. But the data is not static. The application will not be static. The data scientist has to make sure that they monitor the life cycle of this ML-based application and oversee it for the future uh, deployments. Throughout this life cycle, across all three phases, there are bottlenecks for both system and human efficiency. An outline for the talk, 
let me give a little bit more of an educational overview of what is this ML system, why this new phrase that have come, has come about recently, and then why it is important to optimize ML systems, and then talk about multi-query optimization techniques that I've been exploring in some of my recent research for ML systems. If you're worried about how much time it's going to take, this is your time breakdown, and you can decide for which part you want to sleep if you want to sleep. Okay, so what does ML systems and how does it relate to just machine learning? Machine learning as a field has been around for half a century. What is different? At a high level, ML systems as a field relates to ML the way computer systems relates to theoretical computer science. Sort algorithm, in theory, is different from a sort algorithm when you do a petasort for sort benchmark competition. You have to consider a lot of other issues. In the ML world, the main concerns are overridingly accuracy, prediction accuracy for various prediction tasks, in many cases, they also worry about runtime efficiency. Um, how much time does it take to do the training and the inference? But in the ML systems world, there are additional practical concerns that need to be taken into account. What if the data set does not fit on single node memory? That's the concern of scalability. And you don't just want to scale. You want to be efficient in terms of resource utilization at scale. How are the features and the models for your prediction functions configured? That's the problem of usability. How does all of this fit within production workflows and systems that people have in various deployments in the enterprise and web and other domains? And that's the manageability concerns. And finally, how do we simplify the development, the implementation of the techniques we build for these ML systems so that software engineers that build these tools can be more productive? That's what I call developability. Across all of these, you can see that these concerns are pretty much common across most forms of computation. But what makes ML quite unique is that you can often trade off accuracy a little bit to gain enormously on one of these other desiderata. Now, all of these concerns have been longstanding concerns in the relational database systems world for almost th three, four decades. But now you might be wondering, wait, what do database systems have to do with machine learning systems? And the answer, at an intellectual level, the core is the database field and the machine learning field are essentially about programs for processing large and complex data sets. You can call it big data if you like the buzzword. What do I mean by that? Well, this slide is probably the most important slide you can take away beyond my own research. And this is a system stack analogy that I'm going to give. At the root of all computing is the hardware. The hardware for doing computation, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, CPUs, whatever. The hardware for storing bits. Non-volatile memory is now becoming a big deal. And the hardware for moving bits around, like fast interconnects and networks. At the top, you have the theory of the computation. And for the relational DB systems world, the theory flows from first order logic, complexity theory primarily, and some other aspects of computation theory. But what connects the theory to computer science? Now, a lot of this is predates computer science, or complexity theory came about with early stages of computer science, is a program formalism that helps root the software that you write. And for the database systems world, that was a relational algebra that got introduced that allowed you to abstract out the logic of the database uh, programs into forms that can be modularized and you can compose systems. And that helped inform execution primitives that went up from the hardware level. And for DB systems, that's parallel relational operator data flows. These are the building blocks for these DB systems. But in between relational algebra, and the parallel uh, relational operator data flows, there is a big gap. And that's where program specification and program modification come in. Program specification basically means, how does a human user interact with the system? We don't specify relational algebra. We specify a declarative query language, like SQL. Um, and that's how a user interacts with the system to execute relational computations. Program modification is one of the cardinal kind of areas within the database world. Query optimization. The user is shielded from the details of the execution primitives and the hardware where you don't have to worry about writing high performance software. You just specify what you want and how you want is done by the system. What is the analogy in the ML systems world? Now again, ML systems operate on hardware, so you have emerging hardware tailored to ML as well. But at the root of ML is the theory of machine learning. So the learning theory which combines statistics and probability with function analysis is at the heart of what machine learning does. That's how you learn about generalization. And there's also optimization theory. How do you optimize functions, convex, non-convex, whatever? 
There are other aspects of some other forms of machine learning, but these days predominantly it's about learning theory and optimization theory. And what is the formalism that's an analog for uh, relational algebra? In the ML world, it's linear algebra. Matrix operations, and a lot of software, that's sort of the formalism for building this software. And gradient descent, primarily stochastic gradient descent these days, especially for deep learning. Execution primitives have also been pretty much nailed for a lot of cases. Blast, Eigen, LAPAC, all of these sorts of linear algebra, hardware optimized linear algebra routines are already around, have been around for a while. But what is in between is this big gap this open space where we do not yet fully know what the program specification interfaces should be. People have been using various kinds of things. R has been very popular. Scikit-learn is now popular. TensorFlow, all sorts of tools keep coming out. Their programming models are quite different. And it's not settled yet. And then there's this big question mark over here. What does query optimization have to do here with ML systems? And a lot of my research focuses on this, the specification interfaces and the automated program modification. Now, when I say ML systems, one size does not fit all. The landscape of ML systems is heavily fragmented. A large fraction of ML users still use in-memory ML libraries. Things like R, Python, NumPy, scikit-learn, and so on, because the bulk of the data sets can fit in single node memory. But when the data set does not fit in memory, a lot of users, especially in the enterprise world, like using ML on top of data flow systems or relational DBMSs. And so you have tools such as Spark ML, Madlib, as Dan mentioned, System ML that have come about to allow you to scale to larger than memory data resident in a DBMS or a data flow system. More recently, deep learning tools have been uh, created to allow you to program complex neural network architectures very easily, which was not supported by these prior tools. And they are basically custom stacks that utilize lower level execution primitives. TensorFlow, PyTorch, CNTK, CAFE, MXNet, whatnot. There are other forms of machine learning that have their own custom stacks. Four trees, uh, gradient boosted decision trees, XGBoost is a custom stack, came out of here, I believe, Carlo, uh, that's widely used for structured data with trees. Deep Dive is a stack um, that basically handles Markov logic networks and statistical relational learning, also came out of here, um, Markov logic networks. Now, in the cloud, all these companies are abstracting away all the complexity of the system and providing easy to use APIs, but what goes on behind those APIs is something for the cloud vendors to discuss. And that's why I was at MSR yesterday chatting about what's going on within Microsoft. Um, but some of the bottlenecks that I'm gonna talk about are abstract. They arise no matter what ML system you use because they are fundamental about the process of building and deploying ML-based analytics applications. However, in order to show the benefits, you have to prototype them on specific system environments and in my lab's research, these are the three main groups of vehicles for showing the benefits of our uh, research. In memory tools, data flow and DBMS, ML, and deep learning tools. A comment about cloud services. Yes, almighty cloud is gonna solve all of our problems. If your processes are too complex, just move them to the cloud. Okay. Now, of course, as users, we don't have to worry about the complexity, but as system developers in these cloud companies, they have to worry about what the ML system should do. And so what, no matter who is adopting this research or who wants to uh, build these systems, we need to study them from an abstract perspective. So in my lab's research, we look at the entire life cycle of the ML-based analytics application, and we have two umbrella projects. In the context of data sourcing and model building, in Project Triptych, we are building an end-to-end, -end, what I call model selection management system that optimizes for data preparation and feature construction and model selection. And in the context of model deployment, which also interplays with model building, we are focusing on one class of workloads uh, in Project Genesis, where we want to enable database systems and data flow systems to be able to process unstructured data using the latest deep neural network technology. And the vision I call this is database perception system, where your DBMS manages machine perception for you. In today's talk, I'm going to go deeper into Project Triptych, especially, especially this uh, notion of model selection and data sourcing and talk about some of the technical work from our recent research. Okay, so now let's move on to why we need to optimize ML systems. So what is this model selection process? The model selection process is a necessary evil. It's like inevitable whenever you want to apply ML to any sort of application. And the goal is as follows. Given observations about a hidden data generating process that you may not be able to describe exactly, you have examples from that process you need to construct a prediction function that approximates or captures that process. It could be any kind of data generating process. 
customers who churn, say you're an insurance company, your customer leaves you and moves to a competitor. That's a data generating process. Recommendation systems, where you want to predict who's going to purchase what products, that's a data generating process. All of this produce data with which you can build ML models. There are three main things that need to be decided to build prediction functions. The first is how do you represent the signals about the data generating process as precise uh, vectors? And that's the process of feature engineering or data representation engineering. A lot of domain-specific insights and knowledge go in here. Then comes the process of algorithm selection, or increasingly these days with neural networks, is neural architecture selection. What is the class of prediction functions you want to use for your task? And finally, machine learning programs have been designed to be general purpose. They are not aware of a specific data set or an application domain. An SVM is an SVM no matter where, where you use it. Hyperparameter tuning is the process by which you can customize the prediction functions you get for your specific data set so that you fine tune it for your prediction uh, goal. Unfortunately, none of these processes are one shot slam dunk where you just run one program and then you're done with it. In the real world, model selection is an iterative exploratory process where the data scientist explores what I call a model selection triple or an MST, feature engineering, algorithm selection, and hyperparameter tuning decisions. And this is how it proceeds. Have this data scientist, first thing they have to do is decide and specify an MST manually in an ML system. Say they pick this combination. Then they execute it on an ML system to evaluate its accuracy, consume the results manually, and decide what to change for the next iteration. Maybe a different hyperparameter combination, maybe a different algorithm, maybe a different feature set. And this proceeds iteratively. Unfortunately, this exploration process the throughput of exploring different MSTs is absolutely critical for both user productivity and for efficiency. But there's this massive disconnect where almost all ML systems today have their abstractions designed to allow you to explore one MST per iteration. Take TensorFlow, you can train one neural network with one hyperparameter. Even if you specify grid search, it will run them one at a time. Good yes, good yes, Dan. A-S-H-E, Oh, yes, yeah. so this is a feature engineering decision. This is an algorithm selection decision, and this is a hyperparameter tuning decision. So think of it like, here's the feature set I want to use. I'm dropping some of them. That's a feature engineering decision. Algorithm selection could be I want to use, say, a logistic regression model. Hyperparameter tuning is, here's my regularization parameter. This is my step size parameter. And then now you evaluate the accuracy. You're not happy with it. Go change your features, or go change the regularizer. That's sort of how model selection proceeds. Now, in the recent past, AutoML has uh, become very popular in certain regimes where you try to cut the data scientists out of the loop and automate a lot of this search process. People have studied hyperparameter search heuristics for a while. In the machine learning world, you can write meta-level heuristics that basically automate the search process. So now you have these two extremes. On the one hand, one-at-a-time exploration is slow and painful and wastes a lot of system resources. On the other hand, automation cuts the data scientist out of the loop, you waste the user's expertise in many cases. In some cases, it may not even be possible because you can't automatically figure out what the features are. So the data scientist's intuition about the application can still be helpful. On top of that, a blind search procedure that is generic could also waste enormous amounts of compute resources. There was a recent example of Google publishing neural architecture search using deep reinforcement learning. And they showed that the model architecture that the automation procedure learned was compet competitive with hand-engineered ImageNet CNNs. And then Benrec pointed out on Twitter that the amount of power that that automated procedure consumed in terms of GPUs could power a house for an entire year. So to build one model, you're consuming as much power as a house for a year. Now, that's untenable. This is not Bitcoin mining. <laughs> so we have these two extremes. The key research question for the ML systems world researchers across all the fields, are there more flexible data scientist friendly middle ways between these two extremes to increase MST exploration throughput while still not sacrificing their expertise? And that's the vision of the project Triptych, where inspired by database systems, we try to elevate this process, abstract them, and elevate them to a declarative level, whereby I mean higher level APIs to understand these three components and specify them in bulk. So it could be multiple feature sets at a time, multiple neural architectures at a time, multiple hyperparameters at a time. Now, if you think about it, some tools like Keras and Scikit-Learn already offer certain aspects of this, like grid search or random search for hyperparameter tuning. 
that is already a higher level specification than just specifying individual hyperparameters. This project takes that vision all the way. Under the covers, you generate code for a lower level ML system. And that's where you can apply optimization techniques inspired by multi-query optimization in the relational world. And since the system has higher level knowledge about the process, the way these different uh, options are combined, it can help you consume the results, debug the procedure, and ensure reproducibility. And we can apply ideas from the database world uh, for provenance management, why the model works a certain way, what sort of data was used for the models, and so on. Potentially, this could help improve the uh, number of iterations you need to do to get to a satisfactory accuracy while also improving the performance of the system because you're applying optimization techniques. This basically entails creating new APIs that allow you to specify multiple MSTs in bulk and combine them in ways that match the way at which the way data scientists approach this process and applying database inspired optimization techniques tailored towards machine learning workloads so that we can systematize and optimize this process. And I believe this sort of vision can act as a substrate for new declarative AutoML frameworks, where instead of hard coding one procedure for searching, you create a declarative language for writing search programs, all of which can coexist on the same platform. And so now a data scientist can create an AutoML procedure for their data set. Another data scientist can create an AutoML procedure for another data set, and so on. So the key benefits of optimized ML systems, lower completion time by exploiting the relationship between different MSTs and reducing system resources. Higher ML user productivity potentially because they can go through different MSTs much more rapidly and hopefully lower resource costs, especially in the cloud where you pay as you go for every bit of compute and storage and that, that you purchase. So yes? You just have a list of, of uh, possible feature engineers, possible algorithms, which is prior combinations. Yes. See what comes up. Yes, and so how they are related to each other is where we need to figure out what the API should be. Yeah. And so I will give you. Yeah, there is a constraint language that tells you that you can't combine this feature in with that algorithm. And that's a good point. It turns out that figuring out what are all the possible feature engineering options is untenable. There could be all sorts of feature engineering options. So we could target certain use cases for certain restricted sets of workloads. We have done this for certain aspects of feature engineering. I will talk about some of that. but. It's a big open question, what should the APIs be? What should the formalisms be? OK, so squint your eyes. Optimizing model selection ML systems leads us to a new world of query optimization. And here, one MST execution is basically one sequence of queries. So what are these new optimizations, and how can existing ML systems exploit them? That's sort of the whole research goal. And I'll talk about some of the multi-query optimization techniques we've been looking at in my research. Specifically, I'll be talking about uh, this uh, area of optimizations called ML over joins, and then feature transfer, or transfer learning, from deep CNNs, and then talk about some ongoing and future work. So the ML over joins, it attacks this fo following problem. It's a fundamental bottleneck in feature engineering, which is in the real world, relational data are typically multi-table, connected by key point and key dependencies and other dependencies. But almost all ML toolkits assume that the training data set is a single table, which forces the data scientist to materialize the join output. So here, for example, you have the star schema join, one fact table, two dimensions table, do a key foreign key join, and materialize the join output, denormalize it. All the records from the dimension tables get repeated for all the references from the fact table. This could blow the data up in size. This sort of multi-table schema are ubiquitous. They arise in all sorts of domains where there's structured data. Insurance, where you join customers, tables with employers and areas. Recommendation systems, ratings joined with users in movies, retail, uh, hospitality, even in life sciences. Denormalization of this table and using the single table is this leads to system efficiency issues. You could waste a lot of storage space because you're creating this big fat intermediate file. And it could waste runtime because ML that operates on this redundant big table could be wasting a lot of computations um, and thus wasting runtime. It could also lead to human efficiency issues. If your input data changes, if new records come in, now the data scientist has to worry about maintaining this big fat intermediate file and that could impede their productivity. And they have to do this exploratory analysis. And so in the overall process, wasting the runtime for every iteration could actually reduce their overall productivity. 
And increasingly these days, like I said, a lot of machine learning analytics computations are moving to cloud services. Every bit of extra storage and runtime you have to purchase in a pay-as-you-go fashion means you're going to pay extra money. That may be great for Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, but not so great for domain scientists, for enterprise users, and even for many teams within those web companies. In the ML over joins series of work, we basically looked at this problem. And in Orion and Morpheus, we introduced this notion of avoiding joins physically for ML. What that means is do not construct this intermediate denormalized table. Forget about these key foreign key joins to construct the table. ML operates directly on the normalized input. That is inspired by relational pushdown optimizations that have been celebrated for several decades. The data can be potentially much smaller, which means the ML computations can run much faster. But because it's an algebraic rewrite, accuracy does not get affected. You get exactly the same model, except much faster. This could potentially improve human efficiency and system efficiency. Going one step further, we also introduce this notion of avoiding joins logically, by which I mean you forget that an entire table exists. Pretend as if it doesn't even exist. Just use the others. Now, obviously, that can run faster because you're using fewer tables. But we showed by applying learning theory that in many cases, the accuracy will be unaffected or be very close to unaffected. And that's in Project Hamlet. And that could potentially improve system and human efficiency further because you're operating with even fewer data tables. So let's ground this discussion in a concrete example for joins before ML. Insurance. So customer churn prediction is a task that arises in virtually all enterprise settings, even apparently in cloud services settings, I was told by Microsoft yesterday. Basically, they want to prevent their customers from leaving them and moving to a competitor. That's called churn. And so churn prediction means you want to use data about past customers that have left the company or not, and their attributes like gender, age, income, employers, and so on, as features for machine learning and build classifiers. One of those features could be their employer. And they might have a separate table about employers. Where is their headquarters? What's their revenue? And so on. And so that is a foreign key that refers to another table. The attributes about the employers could be more features for your churn model. Maybe employers that are, maybe customers that are employed by universities in Washington are less likely to churn. Maybe customers employed by universities in Illinois are more likely to churn. So you really want all these features to be tossed into your model. That's why you have joins. Now, more joins could be possible even in the simplified example. Insurance companies actually go out of the way to purchase data about crime and traffic and weather and join them with the zip code of the customers. Given this, in the Project Orion, we introduced this notion of factorized machine learning, where the insight was very simple. Like I said, in the relational optimization world, we push down selections, projections, and aggregates through joins. Here we ask, can we decompose ML computations rewrite them, and push them down through joins to the base table. And for this particular piece of work, the first paper, Sigmod 15 paper, we focused on a large class of ML models that are popular in practice, generalized linear models, solved using batch gradient methods. Notice that unlike relational queries, ML programming models are not settled. There's still various types of uh, model, forms of ML models, so we focused on this class of ML models. The join basically concatenates the feature vectors. So XC here is the features from customers. XE are the features from employers. Given this, the core of the computation for gradient descent for GLMs is the following expression. It's the gradient computation. Nabla L, where L is called the loss function, and W are the coefficients of your model, like the hyperplane for your logistic regression model. It is basically a sum over n terms, where n is the number of training examples, say the number of labeled customers, of a scalar function G that takes in and computes the inner product between the model W and the feature vector xi. And then it multiplies that scalar with the entire feature vector xi and adds up all these vectors. So this is the core mathematic, mathematical computation that takes place for these ML training procedures. So this is, uh, no, this is already the gradient of the loss function? Yes. Okay. This is the gradient of the loss function. And gradient descent basically uses this gradient iteratively for multiple passes. So the loss function is without uh, the Xi? The loss function will have the xi. It could be like a squared loss or a log loss. And then you take the gradient, and then you get an expression like this. The, val the function g is a scalar function that differs based on what the GLM is. Like for linear regression, for logistic regression, for linear SVM, the function g is different. But all of them have the same mathematical structure, where you compute this in a product, and then you multiply it with the whole vector. 
Now, given this, observe that the inner product can be rewritten as sum of two partial inner products. You split up the coefficient vector into coefficients over customer features and coefficients over employer features. Now you do one pass over the employer's table, construct the partial inner product, keep it in memory, and then just use it when you do a pass over customers to look it up. So now you reconstruct the full inner product by doing one pass over the employers, one pass over the customers separately. We have pushed down the inner product through the joint. But notice that you have to multiply the entire feature vector. So when you're doing a pass over customers, you won't have access to employer features. So it turns out that to execute this full push down, you need one pass over customers and two passes over the employer's table. So one over the fact table, two over the dimension table. But this still achieves a full push down. You don't ever have to construct the join physically. You don't even have to construct the join in a lazy fashion. Yes, Dan. Oh, so the first scan over employers constructs the partial inner product. And then the second scan is over the customers, which is stitching together full inner product. And then you partially aggregate these vectors. The third scan, you go back to the employers to basically multiply the feature vectors from the employers. OK? Exactly. Exactly. So you look at the dimension table, come back to the fact table, go back to the dimension table. Now, this looks simple enough, but doing this on a real system, you have to tackle challenges of scalability. Neither table might fit in memory, so how do you scale this to larger than memory data? And what I call developability. How do you integrate this with existing, say, in database machine learning tools or other ML tools? This is what we tackle in this paper. I'm happy to chat offline if you're interested. We prototyped this on RDBMSs, uh, PostgreSQL. We also prototyped this on Hive and Hadoop and Spark. We extended this to not just gradient descent with batch methods like deepest descent or LBFGS or convolute gradient, but also stochastic gradient descent and coordinate descent. We also extended this to probabilistic classifiers like naive base and clustering techniques. All of these can be pushed down through the joint. And I'm happy to say that this idea has been adopted in production used by a bunch of companies or explored currently. So Microsoft used, um, I prototyped some of this for web security use cases where they were trying to predict malicious user accounts. Um, Logic Blocks is a database company in Georgia that I think is now acquired. Uh, they implemented this internally for some of their retail analytics use cases. Turns out their main customer, Walgreens, had a five table join that they were worried about. And then Google recently uh, tried some of this ideas for machine learning on their internal data platform for the ads backend. So this is a data infrastructure and analytics team. Now, in Project Morpheus, we wanted to take Orion and see how far can we push it. And the question was as follows. Every time you rewrite these ML computations, you have to know what the ML computations do and create an entire new stack. And so the question was, can we automate this sort of pushing down computation through join without hand rewriting of every ML algorithm out there? And the idea in the Morpheus project was a large class of ML algorithms are essentially bulk linear algebra programs. They take the data matrix or feature matrix and transform them using matrix vector multiplication, matrix matrix multiplication, and so on. And so now if we can create a framework of algebraic rewrite rules for individual linear algebra operators, all programs express the compositions of those operators can get rewritten automatically. And this appeared in VLDB 2017 as a pictorial depiction of how it compares qualitatively. Factorized machine learning, the prior world was like in Orion. You take GLMs, rewrite the stack over a DBMS engine. Dan Otenu from Oxford followed up and did some factorized regression models over some uh, factorized DBMSs. And if you want to do it on Spark again, you rewrite everything from scratch, understand the ML algorithm's data flow, and rewrite it. But in the Morpheus, the vision was you write various ML algorithms, like GLMs, ordinary least squares, k-means clustering, non-negative matrix factorization. And then Morpheus, as a factorized linear algebra framework, automatically produces the factorized version of your ML algorithm. And you can now run this on top of a linear algebra engine. Could be R, could be MATLAB, or a scalable linear algebra system, like Oracle R Enterprise, which allows you to scale to database resident data. Or Spark R, which allows you to scale linear algebra computations to uh, Spark RDBs. System ML, TensorFlow, and so on. So the focus was on creating this algebraic framework that automates the rewrites. So how does that work? The central idea was this new abstraction that we introduced called the normalized matrix that represents the join in linear algebra syntax. How does that work? Now, I'm a database guy, so I like showing you relational algebra expressions. So here's your join expression. S 
and R. R is your employees table, S is your customers table. And XS is the feature vector from the customers. XR is the feature vector from the employers. FK is your employer ID, the foreign key. And RID is the employer ID in the employers table. You're doing an equity join, projecting out whatever you don't need. And then you get the denormalized table T with X, which is a concatenation of the feature vectors from XS and XR. OK, so this is your denormalization join. In linear algebra syntax, the excess feature vector can be represented as a matrix. Let's say the dimensions are n times ds, where n is the number of labeled customers. xr is also a matrix, nr times d, um, dr, where nr is the number of uh, employers. Typically, n is much, much bigger than nr. Like fact tables are usually much taller than dimension tables. And x is t is n times d, where n is the same as the number of labeled customers. Assume the join is not selective. And d is just ds plus dr. Okay, so this is your linear algebra syntax for the feature matrices. What do you do about this join? We introduce this notion of an indicator matrix, K, whose dimensions are n times nr. So it's a cross product, n times nr, so it's very large, but it's ultra sparse. The ijth entry of K is 1 if the ith row of S refers to the jth row of R. So it's an ordinal constraint. You look at the ith row of uh, S and then put a 1 in the jth column if it refers to the jth row of R. Otherwise, it's a 0. So overall, the matrix K, even though it's enormous, n times n R, has only n non-zeros. And so that's how you represent the key foreign key dependency as a matrix. Because it's a sparse matrix, you don't have to store n times n R. You just store it as um, the ones only store the non-zeros. Given this, we can verify that the denormalized feature matrix T is basically S with k times r stitched columnar fashion. So what does k times r do? When you multiply this r matrix with k, you get an n times dr matrix. All it does is it takes the rows of r and spreads them out based on the key foreign key dependency. That's how your denormalization takes place as a matrix multiplication. And then you stitch the two matrices together. You get the full denormalized matrix. So this k times r is what we want to avoid, because that causes denormalization, introduces redundancy into the data. And so now the Morpheus framework becomes clear. You have to introduce algebraic rewrite rules that take LA operations over T and rewrite it into LA operations over S, K, and R. So this triple S, K, and R is what we call the normalized matrix. It's the first time the notion of logical data independence was brought to the linear algebra world. So let's consider a very common LA operation in ML. Left matrix multiplication arises in linear logistic regression, SVMs, and so on. You have a parameter vector W to model the coefficient vector. And then you multiply that with t, so t times w. You rewrite this as s times ws, where ws is basically you split up w into coefficients over the features from s, and wr is the coefficients over features from r. Do the pre-computations r times wr. You get a vector. Multiply that with k. That vector gets expanded. Do the pre-computation s times ws. You get a vector. You add these two vectors. And now you're able to get t times w's result without doing any redundant computations. This is basically the linear algebra rewrite rule for what I showed with Orion, where we rewrote the inner products. But now, because we are able to abstract this in this form, we can do this for many LA operations. We did this for right matrix multiplication, cross product, pseudo inverse, and a bunch of others, about 10 operators. And with those, you can actually represent a lot of ML algorithms, all GLM solved with gradient descent, so it generalized the Orion work but also k-means clustering, non-negative matrix factorization, the algorithm that Altin published about, all of that. They were all automatically factorized. You have to write the linear algebra code as if you're operating on a single table. Morpheus will automatically rewrite it to the multi-table uh, version of the data. OK, any questions? OK, now to give you a snapshot of the empirical results, why this is beneficial, we did a prototype in R. Turns out it was just 800 lines of code. We just had to overload linear algebra operators in R. Commodity machine, and we had this multi-table real-world star schema data, Yelp, ratings, users, businesses, and another from Expedia, um, listings, hotel search details. Here's the runtime on the y-axis and the ML algorithm on the x-axis that was written in linear algebra syntax using our normalized matrix abstraction. Logistic, linear, k-means, and NMF. We compare the materialized execution, which means you construct the join output and then use the single table. We do not include the time for constructing the join output, so that favors materialized. 
and we compare it against Morpheus execution, where you run the same code, but on the normalized matrix, which automatically factorizes under the covers. For logistic regression, we saw 30x speed up on the up data set, 36x for linear, and substantial speed up for the other data sets as well on different models. So we could get even over an order of magnitude speed up. Why? Because Morpheus operates on the normalized input. The data could be much smaller. You do not have any redundant computations that you get with materialized execution. Yes? So both Morpheus and materialized uh, were running in R? They were running in R, yes. Yes. So, uh, oh, so how, how does this compare if you, if you were to run this in like, like TensorFlow instead of R? We've actually done that. Okay. <laughs> and it was the same result. <laughs> yes? Why is K-means not, does not receive nearly the same benefits as the other ones? Do you guys have any? Yes, that's there? a good point. We actually go into the details in the paper. We actually did a microbenchmark with every LA operator. Turns out that k-means, some of the computation time is spent on portions that are not part of the data matrix. So they are computations over different matrices. Logistic and linear, bulk of the time goes into the computations that operate on the data matrix. Same thing with NMS. Okay, so the factorized rewrites only help when you're operating on the data matrix. The machine learning algorithm can do other computations too. More questions? Okay. So again, I'm happy to report that uh, we built a bunch of prototypes on this that were actually adopted in practice. We also prototyped this for NumPy and Python and uh, Oracle or Enterprise. So Avito is an e-commerce company that's actually downloaded and used our NumPy stack for e-commerce internally. And uh, Oracle is actually trying to collaborate with us to apply this to some banking use cases. Oracle or Enterprise is an engine that allows you to store your data in a DBMS and write R-like code that can be scaled under the covers using translation to SQL. That's an engine that they have. We also extended this to nonlinear feature interactions. When you're doing linear models, for example, you want to construct pairwise interactions of features to basically improve accuracy. We've come up with novel rewrites that allow you to push down through joins for feature interactions as well. And again, for TensorFlow, we have uh, both the factorized version and a lazy join version that avoids constructing the uh, table for many batch gradient descent. That's in the works. It's, there is a version of the code out there. Google, I'm happy to say, gave me a faculty research award for the Morpheus project in 2017, 2016, 17. So Morpheus essentially combines classical database query optimization idea of pushdowns with linear algebra properties to optimize this MST that combines feature engineering for joints with algorithm selection for training the model. Now moving on, I'll talk briefly about the Hamlet work. I'll again, observe the key foreign key join customers, foreign key employers. Now here's an observation. Given the employer ID, all the features of the employers are fixed. Amazon state and revenue and all of that stuff. So in information theory terms, the employer's features are redundant given the employer ID. And that motivated us to ask the question, do we really need the employer's features? Can we just avoid all the features of the employers and just use the employer ID as a feature? Um, turns out that even though it's redundant, there's another notion in information theory called feature relevancy. And some of the features of the employers could be highly predictive of the target. And so you have this redundancy relevancy trade-off that matters. And in the ML world, you handle this with feature selection, and it automatically figures out which features are useful. But here, what we are doing is avoiding a join by looking only at the database schema without doing any computation. And so what we needed to understand was, if you avoid the join altogether and you throw away those features, how does ML accuracy change? We applied statistical learning theory, the theory of bias variance trade-off, and connected this with this notion of functional dependencies in databases. Now, the key forward key dependency creates a functional dependency in the output, assuming certain properties about null. Uh, how, when you avoid the join, how does the bias change? How does the variance change? That's the formal analysis we did. Turns out that the bias does not change, but the variance could shoot up. And the intuition is that the employer ID is far more fine-grained than the employer features. There are a lot more employer ID values than employer feature values, for example, state. And so we uh, did this analysis. We applied the theory of VC dimensions to quantify what is the potential rise in variance, and therefore, what is the potential rise in error. And we whittled it down to easy to use decision rules, applied this on real world data sets, and found that you can get up to two orders of magnitude speed up. Why? Because you're avoiding a bunch of features up front without doing any computations. Whereas if you had used all the features, your machine learning and feature selection will be trying to figure it out for you. OK, so this is the first known example of short-circuiting the feature selection and learning process using database schema information. Yes? How easy would it be to make this um, an incremental or any time algorithm? That is, um, an algorithm that um, 
just use the features which are saying in the fact table, uh -huh. the easy features, so to speak. Um, you train on those, and if you just let the algorithm continue running, um, you can stop at any time. It might do some of the joins required to get more harder to reach. Right. Yes, that's a good point. So it depends on what the algorithm is. Not all, al all algorithms proceed in this iterative manner. Some algorithms actually, you need all the features available up front, and then they figure out the correlations and do it. But some algorithms do do it in this incremental manner where they add features one at a time. With this sort of schema-based short circuit, you can actually short circuit those algorithms in the online setting as well, if the features you get to know only in the later on stage. Um, but yeah, it depends on the feature selection algorithm, whether that capability is there. Here, this is this notion of avoiding the join by just looking at the schema is independent of the ML algorithm and the feature selection algorithm. It works for what we showed was models with any VC dimensions that are linear. And then the subsequent work, we showed that it works for actually any ML classifier. Yes? So if I'm a user of your system, how should I decide the trade-off? Yes, that's a good question. What you need is look at the schema, see if there are functionally dependent features. And then our decision rule requires you to compare what we call the tuple ratio, the number of tuples in the customers versus the number of tuples in the employers. If that is above a threshold, then we declare it as safe to avoid the join. And so you only need the metadata, the number of tuples. No, like accuracy, uh, like no yes, you have to specify sort of an error constraint, like what is the amount you're willing to tolerate, like say 0 0.01 or something like that. And so we have these thresholds tuned for those sorts of types of schemes. Okay. Now notice that this works on any tool. It doesn't matter what the ML system is, in memory, in database, in whatever. It doesn't matter what the ML algorithm is, linear models, probabilistic classifiers, neural networks, decision trees, it works for everything. Because we are basically abstracting it out as learning theoretic uh, routines that only look at hypothesis spaces and the VC dimensions of the classifiers. Now again, I'm happy to report that this idea was adopted for pract in practice by a bunch of companies. Yes? Yeah, I want to drill into that point a bit. So yeah. if, if I have a tolerance of 0.01, mm -hmm. um, is there a proof, as in, is there a guarantee that uh, um, excluding this, uh, these attributes will not affect my accuracy by more than that threshold? There is, I wouldn't call it a guarantee, because in statistical learning, the guarantees are all probabilistic. So we have basically upper bounds and conservative decision rules that allow you to basically look at that it won't happen. And so empirically, we find that among the multiple data sets we compare, that never happened. And so that's sort of what the kind of guarantees learning theory can give you. The potential rise in error, there's probabilistic guarantees that it will not go beyond that particular threshold. Okay, so, thanks. So can we this as sort of try to like encode the uh, database constraint, which is non like, semantic data that yeah. the DBA or the user node to the ML system? Yes. So this is sort of one of those bridges between the database world and the ML world. You can view this as a pre-processing step. And so you can now build an advisor for machine learning model building that basically uses this rule to suggest to a data scientist, hey, you know what? These tables are not really needed for you if you want more accuracy. And so that's what we saw in the production use cases. Some of them, they said, oh, some of these tables are owned by different teams. So even to start the machine learning process, I have to jump through hoops to get those tables to join. But with these sorts of decision rules, you can say that table is probably not beneficial. Let me punt on that. I don't need it for now. Those sorts of use cases. In particular, one of the use cases is make my trip. It's like India's Expedia. This, I got this random email from this engineer there saying they applied this, this, and then they got 8x speed up in production. Their manager was impressed and whatnot. And then that student applied for a master's at UCSD and came to UCSD, and now he's my TA. <laughs> <laughs> That's like sort of the best anecdote I have from academic research. OK. So basically, Hamlet combines DB schema design concepts with learning theory to optimize this, again, learning over joint process. Moving on, let me talk briefly about this notion of feature transfer and, again, why multi-career optimization matters there. And what are CNNs? Now, you've heard convolutional neural nets everywhere. Deep learning is all the rage. CNNs are basically feature extractors that have parameters that are learned from data. So here, for example, you have a data set of images that allow you to train a CNN. Given an image, the CNN transforms the image, which is basically a multidimensional array, a tensor, into a bunch of other tensors with weight matrices. And these weights are learned from the training data. Each of these tensors can be viewed as feature transformations of the data. And this is why CNNs are doing really well, because the features that the CNNs learn outperform manually engineered features 
in vision. People have actually shown that if you visualize some of these features that their CNNs produce, they have some interesting properties. At the low level layers, they produce kind of edge detectors and corner detectors. Mid level, you have a little bit more abstract shapes. And the higher level, you have shapes that resemble the categories that you want to predict in the output layer. Like in ImageNet, that's like dogs, cats, buses, and whatnot. So these features actually have some sort of semantic interpretation. It's very loose. It's very heuristic. But at least it's there. And so this has enabled data scientists in some settings to actually exploit CNNs for multimodal analytics. Like consider a recommendation system. You have structured features about products, like brand, tag, price, purchase history, and so on, rating. You build models using the structured data to predict ratings. Increasingly, they want to incorporate product images that are available in the database for this prediction, especially for categories like fashion items, clothing. The visual representation really matters for the popularity of a product. So what they do is they take this image, pass it through a pre-trained CNN, say, strained with ImageNet. You chop off some layers of the CNN, materialize the tensors from certain layers of the CNN as the image representation, concatenate it with the structured features, and train a downstream ML model. Could be a linear model, tree, whatever you want. Okay, So this is basically a form of transfer learning called feature transfer. And it's becoming increasingly common, not just in recommendations, but also healthcare, e-commerce, um, nutrition science, where you have images of foods, and computational advertising. Now, given this, I told you you can materialize this feature layer C3. Why did you pick C3? Why not layer C4? Why not C2? What black magic did you use? Turns out there's only one option, model selection. The user has to try a bunch of different layers and figure out which layer can yield best cross-validation accuracy. This is a feature engineering step. You have to do this exploratory model selection, try different MSPs. Unfortunately, there are two problems here. There's an efficiency reliability trade-off. The efficiency trade-off is if you want to materialize the features for multiple layers that you want to compare, you might have a lot of redundant computations if you do the CNN inference from scratch, from the image. The reliability trade-off happens when you have to materialize all these features that you desire. Today, data scientists have to write down these features as files, read them into memory, and run them in TensorFlow. So manual memory management is what is happening. It reminds us of 70s before relational databases came along, where you have to write code manually. Now, some of these features can be really huge, like some of the ResNet features, for example, 200 times larger than the image. So given this, we have this trade-off, efficiency and reliability. One plan where you materialize all the layers you want up front in database parallel, it's an eager materialization plan. Efficiency is really good, because you don't do redundant computations. Reliability is poor, because you have to do manual memory management. The other plan is you materialize on demand. You do the scene and inference from scratch from the image for the layer you want, and that's in database paradigms called the lazy materialization plan. So there is this dichotomy between efficiency and reliability. Can we bridge this gap and come up with new ideas? And then the question becomes, why is a data scientist doing all this materialization? This is, these sorts of lower level data management decisions should be done by a system. And that's what we do in system Vista, where we elevate feature transfer to a declarative level. The data scientists specify what layers they want to try not how to execute the workload. And the insight here is multiple layers they want to compare are not independent. They are sequentially dependent. To get a downstream layers, a higher layers uh, features, you need a superset of the computations you need for lower layers features. And so what we do is Vista automatically fragments the CNN to create partial, partial inference operations that go from layer to layer and rewrites the computations. It avoids redundancy in computations because it does partial inference, and it manages memory for you. So we prototype this on top of Spark and TensorFlow. The user specifies the feature transfer task in the Vista API, which builds upon MLlib. And we use TensorFlow for specifying the neural architecture you want to transfer from and what layers you want. It's available in a raster of CNNs that are pre-trained. And the optimizer basically decides the execution plan, both how to materialize the features how to configure the system, and how to execute the workload. Under the covers, Spark workers invoke TensorFlow for doing the CNN inference. So yes? The user I specified, please use layer 10, uh, 17, and 29 uh, yes. in my uh, in training data. Mm -hmm. And then you materialize them, or you don't. You decide whether to materialize them or not. How does it work? Yes, so the user specifies what layers and what CNN. And then we decide, based on the memory available, which layers to materialize, when to materialize, 
explain how to run the downstream ML computation. You need to materialize it, those set the user has specified. Yes, but you don't have to do all at a time. Because if you do all at a time, you might exceed the system memory. So you can split it up into, say, just the first two, and then the next two, and so on. So you stage out the computation for the inference. Uh, so in the process, you change the model, the uh, training model? The so here we do not, because it's basically a form of algebraically, right? We are just staging out the way the model is getting trained. So you get exactly the same downstream models that you would have gotten as before, except much faster. OK, so we just tested this on some real data set from Amazon. Turns out that you could run this workload nine times faster if you do this sort of approach. Um, and it never crashes, whereas if you ask users to manually write out features, in some cases, you might exceed Spark memory, and then Spark crashes. Okay, so there's a paper on this under submission. I'm happy to chat more detail offline. So again, it's a form of multi-query optimization where you specify different layers simultaneously, and then the system optimizes across those MFTs. Some ongoing future work. We are looking at deep learning more broadly. Training process for deep learning is incredibly empirical. Now, we have this collaboration at medical school where we have accelerometer data that's labeled activity prediction, sitting, standing, walking, and so on. And they wanted to build ML models for this. They had a baseline, random forest, trained using physics-based features that had some accuracy. And so they wanted to explore deep learning, so we built some deep learning models for them. Turns out that 1D CNNs can give you a significant lift. And they're pretty happy. But to get there, my student had to go through hundreds of CNNs and RNN architectures and hyperparameter combinations to basically actually get that left. The bottleneck turned out to be, again, the throughput of MFT exploration. To build a really good deep learning model, you have to go through enormous hyperparameter combinations and architecture decisions. The more the throughput, the easier the exploration. What's worse, they kept changing the objective for their evaluation. At one point, they said it needs to be point-wise predictions. Then they said it needs to be transitions. So the objective function for the evaluation kept changing, which means you have to redo the exploration all over again, over and over. Now, you could parallelize all this. But then we looked at current parallel deep learning tools and found that it was not a good fit. Why? These are the requirements for stochastic gradient descent, which is the optimization algorithm used for training neural networks. You need to, what is the data access pattern? You shuffle the data randomly. So you basically reorder the data randomly once. And then you do sequential passes over the data for many iterations. During each sequential pass, you take what is called a mini batch, say a set of 50 examples, and then you update the model based on that. And then you look at the next mini batch, update the model, look next mini batch, and update the model. So during one pass over the data, you update the model many times. So what are the key desiderata that we observed from conversations with our collaborators and other domain scientists and enterprise users? Data scalability matters. You may not be able to fit all your data in single node memory. You want to use clusters. And these are not like thousands of machines clusters that Google and Facebook use, but like 10 nodes or um, even four or five GPUs. You need per epoch efficiency of SGD. Every pass should be fast. You need convergence efficiency. SGD should be able to get to a good accuracy in enough epochs. But they also want reproducibility. If you run the training with a given random seed today and you run the same thing tomorrow on the same data, some existing systems don't give you the same model. And that's something that is anathema for them. They want the same model to be obtained when you rerun the same thing. So what is happening here? Here's the trade-off space for the four desiderata. If you run database-style parallelism, which is bulk synchronous parallel processing, like Spark, MLlib, or parallel DBMSs, you get good scalability. It's easily reproducible. It's just algebraic parallelism. Convergence efficiency, and unfortunately, is really poor. Model averaging is what data parallel systems do. You train independent models on each partition of the data, and then you average the parameters, and then you broadcast the parameters again. Turns out that it doesn't converge very well for deep learning, and so pretty much nobody uses parallel databases or Spark for deep learning training. Now, you could do task parallelism. You say you have 10 GPUs. Let's assign one hyperparameter combination to each GPU and use a tool like Python Dask, where it runs each model separately on each node. It requires the data to fit entirely in memory of each node so that it can broadcast the data. So it's not scalable, but it's easily reproducible. Dask also has high efficiency for convergence because you're doing sequential SGD. And its per epoch efficiency is high because there's no communication across the cluster. Now, the web companies like Yahoo and Google, they introduce this notion of parameter servers, which is basically from the distributed systems world, where you do asynchronous parallelism. You have a single node that stores the model, and then workers communicate the models for every mini batch. They communicate gradient updates, pull the updates as and when they are ready, and that happens across the network. 
That has enormous scalability. You can go to thousands of nodes. But its reproducibility is virtually non-existent. Why? Because the asynchrony basically introduces randomness of the physical world. You cannot reproduce it unless you have extreme overhead. Parameter server style approaches do have good convergence efficiency compared to data parallel, but the parity proc efficiency is so poor because you're communicating updates for every mini batch during a pass of HCD. In this landscape, we introduced, uh, we basically observed that parameter servers are actually designed for hundreds of nodes or thousands of nodes, which is an overkill for over 90% of ML users. They may not have a single node data set, but they want only small clusters. It may be six GPUs, 10 GPUs, six nodes, 10 nodes. And so we wanted the best of these two corners, data parallelism and task parallelism, and we introduced an approach that kind of gets there almost all the way there, along all four desiderata. Our approach is called Model Hopper. It works as follows. It's based on a fundamental insight from optimization theory, which tells us that stochastic gradient descent is robust to the ordering of the data. You need to order the data in a random manner, but any random ordering is fine. And so we work as follows. You execute NMSTs on N workers, start an epoch in parallel. Let's say you have four neural architecture starts, one pass over the partition. Now you checkpoint the model and you hop to another worker. So that's the hopper, and then you do a pass over the local partition. Keep hopping until all of D is seen. At the end, all models have seen all data partitions, but every model has seen the data partitions in a sequential order. MOP guarantees a strong theoretical property, which is sequential equivalence. Every model you train in MOP is equivalent to some sequential execution of FGD, so you get high convergence efficiency, high accuracy. And in terms of communication costs, because you're hopping only once per partition, not for every mini batch, the communication cost is dramatically lower compared to parameter servers. We did some initial rough and dirty prototype comparing this to TensorFlow parameter servers on six workers. It was three times faster. So this is the default parallelism mechanism in TensorFlow. And the main reason is the communication cost compared to parameter servers is much lower. MOP nears the lower bound for communication complexity to emulate serial XGD or sequential XGD in a parallel setting. There are other benefits. It's entirely reproducible. All you need is the schedule for model hops. Replay the schedule, you get the same model. There is no overhead for checkpointing and kind of hopping because training dominates the runtime. Four hops is minuscule in this case. It's agnostic to the data type, the neural network type, time series, images, structured data, everything works. Convolutional recurrent networks, doesn't matter. Everything is just stochastic gradient descent based. It doesn't even matter that it has to be neural networks. It can be all forms of GLMs trained using stochastic gradient descent. Replication is fine. You just have two copies of data. Fine. The model is aware that the two copies exist on multiple nodes. Heterogeneity is also fine. You could have multiple GPUs on each node. But there are some challenges. We need to build a resource-aware scheduler that allows you to do this hopping efficiently in an automated fashion, elasticity, fault tolerance, and integration with popular tools. And that's what we're doing in the Cerebro project, a distributed file system under the covers, an API in the Cerebro system. You can specify the neural network in any popular DNN tool. The optimizer and the scheduler for Cerebro will orchestrate the hopping under the covers. Neural query execution for the training utilizes the same framework that you specify based on whatever hardware you give. And you can inspect the models in your popular Jupyter notebooks. So overall, we saw with our initial prototype three times higher throughput. Cerebro ensures resource efficiency, reproducibility, and integration with popular deep learning tools by observing that you can do these sorts of model hops. Overall, Cerebro blends optimization theory, insights about stochastic gradient descent robustness with database and distributed systems techniques to optimize entire sets of MSTs. OK, should we wrap up? Yeah. OK. So there are some other database-inspired optimizations that we looked at in our group. I will skip these in the interest of time, all the way from extending the principles to hardware-conscious execution and in different settings, even in the Internet of Things, and benchmarking these ML systems. To summarize, the ML systems world today as I see it almost resembles the relational database systems world of the late 80s, where there was a massive growth phase and a demand for democratization of these technologies. And I told you about this model selection process and how declarative specification and query optimization can really help accelerate this process. And we want to combine database-inspired query optimization ideas 
with linear algebra, learning theory, and optimization theory principles to build better ML systems. There are other projects in my group focusing on different aspects, such as schematization, pricing of models, and deploying deep nets into practice for various uh, use cases. I'm happy to chat offline about these. These are the terrific students who are in charge of a lot of this work. They've done some spectacular work, and I'm really proud of them. Thank you. I'm happy to take any more questions. So I know we are running out of um, we are running out of over time. So uh, feel free to leave if you uh, if um, you want to leave. But we, uh, if you want to stay behind, we can continue to grill Arun and ask him questions. Sure. So um, my my question was about the motor hopper. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, the degree of parallelism that you can get here is uh, only the number of models. Exactly. Created. It's the set, the size of the set of MSTs that you specify. Okay. And if these models, if, if they are, I don't have a good sense how different. If one is I don't know logistic regression and the other end was in whatever deep neural network, the the their complexity is quite different. Their computational complexity is quite different. That's so true. Then is he, you. You run at the speed of the slowest of the most complex model. Oh, um, that's only if you. This example was simplified. Not all models need to hop at the same time. We can build a general-purpose scheduler. It turns out to be a new variant of job shop scheduling from the operations research world. If you have multiple logistic regression models, you can pack them onto the same machine while the neural network is running on another machine. So the problem is it boils down to a new variant of job shop scheduling. So we are abstracting as a scheduling problem, looking at different use cases showing the runtime complexity for these. It turns out that simple greedy heuristics work in most cases. In other cases, you want an online, basically, scheduler that looks at the data and basically runs uh, the models on, on the fly. But yeah, you can handle different architectures that take different amount of time. You can handle different pieces of hardware that take different amount of time. Another dimension to this problem is the data partitioning. If you have asymmetry, you can also partition the data or repartition data in different ways so that you can take advantage of the heterogeneity of the architectures or the um, hardware in different ways. So we're looking at all these aspects in this particular project. Okay. Yes? One question that I had was that, so this sort of you know combi combinatorial problem that you have of all these features that you want to try, right. um, is the challenge only in the fact that each of these you know, settings that you pick is expensive to you know, train and then see if it works? Right. Or is it just a very large space that you have to explore? It's a mix of both. It depends on the application and the models that you're trying to use. In the statistical learning setting where you have to configure really good features, there is a lot of human intuition involved in exploring different features. And so there, the training itself can be much faster than what you would expect. So the human in the loop, you really want fast exploration of features. In the deep learning world, feature engineering is being obviated and replaced with architecture engineering. Mm -hmm. You really want to configure your neural blocks properly and make sure it's end-to-end -end differentiable and all that. Now it becomes a matter of churning through a huge number of architecture designs and hyperparameters for that. And the human effort for feature engineering is much lower. So something I, I'd be super interested to learn is that, I mean, I think you sort of, uh, sort of teased about it, where like you can, I can think of having a language where the user can you know, specify yes. some relationships for, you know, yep. almost like a type system for like, these things should go with this and yet yes. never go with this. Yep. Um, so like how concretely have those languages been developed? At this point? Not yet. So, so far, the ML system APIs are very low level. They only allow you to train one model at a time. Very rudimentary APIs are available for mixing hyperparameters, like grid search and random search. Part of the triptych project vision is to understand what these APIs should be, what these languages should be, and elevate them to higher level. And I think the sky is the limit. Um, there are all forms of dependencies that we can exploit. In the model hopper, for example, the observation is anything that depends on stochastic gradient descent can be fused. And so now you just construct a set of neural architects. So it depends on our creativity to figure out what these APIs should be. Um, I think the world is moving a lot towards sort of established like linear algebra-based machine learning and graphical models and neural networks. So they n it's not going to be super large, but you just have to look at each space and then figure out what they should be. Um, in terms of the language itself, I think building on top of these execution engines, I focused on the execution engines and the optimizations. The language itself is an open question. All sorts of people, P PL people are getting involved here, what the programming model should be. HCI people are getting involved for visual interfaces and so on. I think there's a rich scope for a lot of work across communities in that space. Okay. Okay, well, let's uh, give a round of applause. Thank you for having me.
Thanks, man. Patience, logic.